Hi, welcome to the latest lecture on regenerative agriculture. Today I have some exciting new stuff in this presentation. Uh, some years back I thought, well, I have figured it all out, uh, but uh, now there is uh, new findings uh, of people who have pushed further and it's just absolutely amazing and uh, the contents you you find uh, combined in this lecture is pretty unique so don't think that is common knowledge not at all uh, and uh, this needs to spread because uh, if we don't move to regenerative agriculture there will be no future for humankind and i mean that that's not just a, 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 some sort of uh, hollow sentence this is reality as we see it and uh, I want water in future and that only regenerates on living soils. Right, so um, this is um, the scenario. Uh, we do have the choice so either we can go uh, direction desert planet, that's where we are still partly headed but uh, sort of uh, lots of development is showing me that we are taking this pathway and not this one and um, the crazy thing is that uh, all this talk about overpopulation is completely nonsense uh, even if 30 billion people should be on earth if we make it a green lush planet that is uh, still in, 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 in quite a few parts, easily 30 billion people can live on earth. We feed cattle and pigs and so on with food that could be uh, eaten by, by uh, humans and that alone would feed 70 billion people. So that's one hint on uh, that a lot of stuff that we take for granted by hearing it repeated again and again and again and again. So propaganda. Uh, so if we look through the propaganda we see that the reality is completely different. And uh, 30 billion people wouldn't mean to give up on uh, uh, well, eating animals. That's the freedom of people to, to have that choice. And we need actually animals to restore the soil. And this lecture will show you a little bit more background on that. Right, so um, when we start uh, diving into the topic, um, we have living soils at the heart. So that's the sort of fundamental thing that we need for a balanced climate and for having food and for regenerating water, for having beauty around, for having bird life, for having insects around and all this. So without living soil, we would be in a uh, well, desert planet that probably wouldn't sustain any higher life. Um, we need to look at no-till organic agriculture and Rotational grazing, so the animals will help. Rainwater harvesting key lines, but I have recently learned that um, if we go to regenerative agriculture, this is actually the best rainwater harvesting we can do. So instead of making uh, swales everywhere, kilometers and kilometers of swales, uh, if we improve agriculture, then the soil, the living soil itself, becomes the rainwater harvesting unit. And um, of course, that's the preferable way of doing it. So don't jump into engineering solutions. Uh, very often there are great solutions um, that are more simple, more cost efficient and more beneficial overall. Then uh, water supply uh, depends on living soils. Sanitation and reuse should work together with living soils. So sanitation and living soils um, connection is there. Organic material that we eat as humans uh, should in some form uh, regenerate soil. 
not directly to food production in my point of view. Uh, then public health is a key issue connected to that. Um, then we have people, policies, legislation, media, stakeholders, land use, agriculture, city and landscape planning and the local economy. So there are a lot of factors in there and um, that um, I want to uh, start a quick overview why we as, a, as an institute of wastewater management and water protection are dealing with regenerative agriculture. Uh, so what we have done so far, we have worked a lot since decades on resources oriented sanitation systems to restore soil. So I've been working on soil uh, indirectly for over 30 years. Uh, but then, by realizing how important uh, soil fertility is, um, we have created uh, our uh, revival uh, research group, uh, and that's for restoration, engineering, uh, rural revival for reversing uh, erosion and uh, better agricultural practice. Um, so, what have we done in this field? So, there is uh, current research going on. For those of you who are interested, ask us for a project work master thesis. We are really happy to have people who are uh, contributing to the development that is so much needed uh, and at the same time ignored so widely. So, we have done comparison of uh, measurement devices for infiltration rates, uh, stability of soil aggregates, uh, measuring compost qualities and so on. Um, then um, we also look for, um, well, here aggregates again, uh, soil fungi cultivation identification of soil bacteria and you will see later on the foot to uh, the, the the fungi to bacteria ratios are crucial for well having living soils and, and having high productivity and when we have high productivity the whole system is regenerative so that goes hand in hand the farmers bring more yield and at the same time they restore soil faster. We have done research on um, uh, highly productive uh, aquaculture system with floating plants and um, the idea came from uh, Stefan Hügel, now Dr. Stefan Hügel, um, and uh, he was doing his math thesis in our project in Ethiopia um, with Dr. Jan Wibbing and uh, then uh, he realized that the reservoirs that are often needed for um, storing some water for the dry season, uh, there are these excesses, enormous, enormous excesses over the rainy season in many areas of the world. But then if that's not captured in living soil, groundwater, but often also in uh, reservoirs to compensate for uh, well, drought uh, season, uh, he came up with the idea to put floating plants on, uh, on the water. So this is uh, the highest productivity that you can have on sort of on land. So a lake or um, a reservoir is sort of on land. And this can be enormously efficient. And he found out that if he feeds um, fish with that, uh, this is the highest productivity on, high, on, on protein in general being many, 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 many fold more efficient than the like uh, cattle production uh, and, and pig production and so on, that often relies on external resources, uh, soy from South America and all this nonsense. And um, by the way, Jan Wibbing is developing fodder systems with uh, Moringa, so it's uh, much better fodder 
than importing some stuff that is making uh, animals ill, basically. And then um, we do have the major breakthrough in rice cultivation by uh, Dr. Tafsif Shah, uh, who did a doctorate at our institute, and he developed a system that can uh, well bring dry rice uh, production uh, well uh, to be the main type of rice production globally, and that can save. 20% of all water consumption globally. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous why our institute comes up with something like that, uh, but um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that story later in the lecture. It's absolutely stunning and please join in, please help. Uh, so Tafsif is now uh, well continuing his work in uh, Kashmir, working with uh, family farmers. And this is so promising, so, so we need more um, uh, workforce in uh, the research itself, but also in um, well, making this known to farmers, to administration, to politicians, to other universities and so on. And we were getting congratulations from Cornell University, who is sort of the pioneering institute in dry rice uh, cultivation. Uh, then myself, I have written a book. Uh, it's not out in English yet. Um, Spanish version is there. Uh, Pathways towards rural development based on solid regenerative economy. So uh, local economy to uh, one of the issues is to reverse over urbanization. We can find hundreds of options to combine the upsides of urban life with the upsides of the rural. Uh, it is an open vision for creating millions of diverse livelihoods, people doing different types of professions, not sitting at a desk all the time, but uh, being in the field part of the day and then to the desk or do teaching or healing work or produce something in a small company with uh, neighbors and so on. And uh, it should be in the rural, uh, if there is nobody left, it should be at least 150 to 300 people to make it viable. And these people can convert farms to sort of new towns, garden ring uh, cities. And uh, uh, with professional gardenings. Um, so that's something I do that has gained a lot of attention in the German, German speaking uh, uh, areas, especially Switzerland and also southern Germany, Austria. And so many people are dealing with this now. And I got a lot of feedback of, of people who have hope for a good future now with having visions and seeing how many great opportunities there are. So this pessimism is, is absolutely ridiculous and, and destructive. So get into a positive mindset. There's so much you can do and find something that is your own thing from your inner longing. And I have found that even without being really connected at that time. Uh, so that's very rewarding. And I love every day of my life and lo I love my job and I love what I have achieved and so on. And so I can only recommend go for what you really, really want to do. Even also with lo looking for project work, master thesis, do what really, really triggers you. So now jumping into it, uh, systems thinking, and we are in regenerative agriculture. We will talk a bit, not so much, the end of humanity. Uh, we will talk more extensively on uh, soil vegetation cover systems. We will talk about proven solutions in large scale farming and hundreds of options in gardening. Uh, so this is sort of mind boggling. If you know a little bit about the real situation, what is taught at uh, universities even today, uh, this is absolutely stunning. So we can do so many things and uh, I'm so grateful that so many great people have developed uh, these wonderful things. And I'm sort of, um, well, also developing some stuff, but it's I'm collecting stuff of other uh, systems 
thinkers that have really achieved a lot. So if we combine all the great stuff, a good future is easily possible. And, um, so, but first a little bit on the, well, dark side of, of things. So there is a quote of somebody from um, a, well, UN uh, organization that deals with agriculture. And it's not a proper scientific article, it's more a citation, but it's true in a sense. It's like only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. Wow, this is really a, a crazy thought, but it's like I can uh, assign that uh, from how I see development. But on the other hand, uh, this shit will not continue. So we, we will not continue this because it's too ridiculous, too strange. And hundreds of thousands of farmers are changing. So the change is coming rapidly and it's not coming from um, like from, from a broad uh, coalition of politicians, what we should have, but it's coming from people who understand the systems and that are uh, simply doing things, even if they are attacked by uh, like media and, and, and so on. And that's great. So we will, we will achieve that and this will not happen. So yes, uh, 60 years left, but only for agrochemical plowing agriculture. So the combination of uh, mineral fertilizer, uh, uh, biocides plowing is deadly for the soil and it is deadly over only a short time span of a few decades. So the agrochemical system is the least productive that is ever imaginable because if you destroy your production system within a, a few decades, you are doing something absolutely crazy and ridiculous and uh, but well, it's earning money for uh, some uh, companies. And uh, so that's the driver behind it, nothing else. So it's like damaging the well, production system of the farmers. Farmers don't earn uh, a lot of money. Many don't earn at all. They just pay all the stuff they have to have externally. Um, and if you get away from the inputs, rely on living soil, the whole story becomes very interesting and farmers earn money basically if they do it right um, and with a little bit of luck and knowledge, uh, basically they earn more from season one. And that's great. And that's what we see in our iRISE uh, system as well. Well, humans have strongly deteriorated or destroyed one third of all fertile soils between 1950-1990 alone. This is US UN um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report uh, from 2005. And uh, so industrial agriculture with plowing and biocides destroy humus, causing starvation for billions in the long run, one billion starving already. And then some people are doing bioenergy while people are starving. They are putting what could be food into uh, biogas plants or put it into uh, bioethanol production and run engines with that or cars. Uh, I don't know what, what to say about it. It's beyond uh, description. To, and basically, it's it's uh, killing people, taking taking the livelihoods away from uh, many many poor people, a billion people starving to die, uh, and uh, this is very often small children uh, at very young age, and even if they are not dying of hunger, they are not able to develop to a uh, well fully. Uh, to their full potential. So an exception in um, energy is wood gas energy, wood gas units, 
So there is good news there. There are also all the solutions are there. And luckily there is change now to agroforestry system that can produce a lot of uh, wood and food at the same time and regenerate a uh, whole region. So also they are very, very, very good development. And um, for a change, uh, policies have decided to give strong support to agroforestry uh, systems um, uh, in, in the European Union. So that's great news. So many farmers will switch now and many people will be needed to be consultants. So why not becoming a consultant for um, agroforestry systems? Environmental engineers can do that. And uh, of course, many other um, engineering backgrounds as well. All right, so why was that? And sorry, I have believed in this myself, so I don't judge anybody. It's just a question of sitting down and looking at the facts and letting it sink in. We want to pr protect ourselves from the harsh truth sometimes. And of course, biogas does make sense for waste um, uh, uh, treatment and so on. So I'm nothing, nothing against that. Uh, wastewater treatment plants, they have their digesters, as you know. So that's great bio, biogas process, but not food and then pretending to produce energy is not really pre uh, producing net energy because of all the losses and all the damage done to the soil. If you add that up, it's a process that is very expensive destruction of soil and well, helping to kill people by starvation. Yeah, uh, to wrap this up, um, um, and by the way, I'm positive, so uh, through all the great solutions. So we humans have everything to do, but we have to do it as humans. We, we can't wait for politicians because they rely on their uh, lobbyists and uh, all these uh, well biased uh, people in uh, universities and everywhere. If these people will wake up, great, uh, but many seem to be very hard headed, especially in academics. Um, they live in a bubble and they often don't realize what they really do. And But more and more, especially the younger generation doesn't do that. And so they are uh, doing real stuff and find out what they can contribute to make a good future for all. Uh, so that is sort of a uh, final note on the destruction of humankind. Um, Agrochemical industry is an absurd fight against nature. Does not make any sense at all, except saving labor, or you could also call that make jobs disappear. But saving labor at the cost of destroying your sales, uh, soil is not a good deal, maybe in the short run, but not in the long run. Remember, 60 harvests left, that's the model here. Uh, it's only a clever, hmm, in <laughs> parenthesis, uh, but parasitic business model. It's parasitic. It's destroying the system itself. It's destroying agriculture. It's destroying the farms, destroying the soil. Destroys soil life and pollutes the groundwater. So we as the water professionals should drive this. And that's why I'm working in this field. Uh, agrochemical industry makes insects and birds disappear. Uh, human health, chronic, chronic illness is rampant and a good business too, unfortunately. Uh, if stopped, farmers can earn more money and we will discuss about how. Agrochemicals applied must prove to be harmless in all aspects and that's something what is a requirement that is so natural uh, but so, <laughs> well, far away for, for many people in, in our uh, strange uh, money-making society. Very low development of society. We are low, low developed society, even though we have our uh, technical gadgets. Who can build these technical gadgets? We are basically helpless and consumers of stuff that we don't uh, really understand very often. 
So if electricity disappears, we are back, not, not even back in Middle Ages, we are Stone Age. And maybe even we will not manage to make fire because we have become such idiots dependent on outside sources. So rent over and let's go on. Um, now, who was developing great stuff? And there is one of my heroes. Um, there are quite a few. Professor uh, William Albrecht, uh, who lived a long life and developed great stuff. Uh, he was uh, uh, researching and teaching at the University of Missouri in the US. That is still a great university for regenerative agriculture. So they are going ahead with uh, like the, the soil regeneration. So we hear from them also further in this lecture. But after World War II, um, all the people he had trained were sort of pushed aside and uh, the agrochemical people appeared miraculously in all the influential positions. Um, in 1936, imagine, there was a, um, well, sort of uh, appeal to the Senate of the US. And um, that was um, called Modern Miracle Min. And uh, it is sort of saying um, that uh, if our soils uh, are uh, further degraded uh, of well, the minerals, um, this will be getting dangerous uh, dietary uh, deficiencies. And um, only this can be remediated if soils are uh, brought back to being uh, healthy soils with, with all the minerals in, in that. And we will deal with this in this lecture. There are great solutions, and um, so also there are great solutions there. But just imagine the ignorance. So this is a very clear thing that is everybody who has a little bit of brain left uh, would see right away the enormous importance for for societies. And uh, so, okay, now hundreds more, uh, well, uh, around 100 years after Professor Albrecht was working and also this initiative here, the, this great initiative. Uh, we are now hopefully getting it, but this requires people working on it. And that's you, that may be you. So if that is your thing, join in. So you will find a lot of like-minded people, but we are a small minority compared to uh, business as usual people who are sort of uh, drowned in everyday uh, business very often. Um, deficiencies of micronutrients are uh, rampant. So uh, I will only go into the example of deficiencies of zinc. Almost 50% of all um, arable land around the world is deficient in zinc. And maybe you know that zinc as a trace element in animals and humans is, um, well, making the immune system work, making the immune system be strong. Similar with boron in 30% of the arable land, molybdenum is lacking in 15% of the soils and that has well de decreased since then and without molybdenum uh, the binding of uh, nitrogen from the air doesn't really work so even legumes wouldn't really produce nitrogen um, and uh, some of the consequences um, this is something what is uh, causing uh, human micronutrients deficiency uh, and this is highly prevalent in low and middle income areas that are com consuming monotonous, uh, monotonous uh, low quality diets. Global deficiency conditions result from inadequate amounts of uh, uh, iodine, iron and zinc. Uh, 
according to WHO, uh, 2 million child deaths globally are attributed to zinc, vitamin A, and iron deficiencies. So this is killing people. So that's a real issue. And keep people uh, healthy is, is a key issue. And it's not only an issue of good nutrition, full nutrition. It's not only an issue of avoiding deficiencies, but it's also of, um, well, helping to um, develop to the full potential. So there's also good food is required for uh, developing the brain in a, in a proper way. So we need the DHA fatty acids. And that can be done with the system that Stefan Hügel has uh, developed with the floating plants and, and fish production or chicken, eggs and, and duck production. Okay, so uh, one example from uh, research. Uh, there is a lot of research that is supporting that. And also some research that is attacking this with uh, wrong uh, assumptions and just imagine the lack of lithium as a trace elements in humans. There was a 12 year study in Texas, USA, and regions with a lack of lithium in drinking water. And this means when that has consequences, means there is not enough lithium in the food either. Um, and this showed two to three times the percentage of violence, depression, suicide, rape, and more. So not 2%, 3%, no, two to three times as much violence, depression, suicide, rape, and more. This is fundamental for a sane society. And I think we are on the way to a sane society, but we have to take things into our hands. We have to develop the stuff from real science and not from marketing science or pseudoscience or like from stuff that is only made for selling something like like such a large percentage of, of uh, the 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 or so so called science uh, even if they work so, so, uh, scientifically with, with in in nonsense fields just to promote something uh, this is misuse of science and um, so all right, um, this is the citation for, for this, but as I said, there are around 30 studies that are supporting this. Um, of course, once again, and that's a like depression is a good business, isn't it? Yeah. Life on Earth uh, can develop in either direction. Scarcity disrupted climate starvation with destruction of soils where the water is not captured, doesn't go to the groundwater, or life and Earth can be abundant for nature and humans with living soils, with vegetation cover year round. Uh, well, income is generated and uh, groundwater recharged. As you see here it's depleting and here it's rising. And that is mainly regenerative, regenerative agriculture and regenerative agriculture is the best form of rainwater harvesting. Only do swales if regenerative agriculture or holistic plant grazing does not work. Yeah, there are probably around 80 plus essential trace elements needed for bacteria, plants, and humans, many can be lacking. So how to add? Uh, you can add rock dust um, and make it part of composting processes. Direct dosing of substances is almost impossible and dangerous because these trace elements can become very toxic if they are overdosed. So you must well do what you do. So that's why I like these volcanic rock dusts. There you can't overdose because the soil life is releasing what is needed. Um, then um, the um, thing is that uh, we have also a source of uh, sea uh, minerals. So the, the oceans are containing a lot of the um, elements, but 
too much sodium chloride, but there are some ways of getting the sodium chloride out and concentrating the good stuff. That also can help in regenerating soils. And we will learn more on that in this lecture. Um, yeah. Uh, one large reason for um, the loss of uh, humus soil degradation is, of course, uh, the, the wrong uh, type of uh, animal uh, husbandry overgrazing, especially the goats are notorious for, for that because they even draw out the roots, so destroying the soil life. <clears throat> but is that really true? So uh, if we go for um, holistic plant grazing, this will change. Vegetation cover must be the right one. So if you cover with eucalyptus forest, uh, this is a picture from Ethiopia. Uh, this is where even a or seemingly lush forest has severe erosion underneath. So this is just stunning. And uh, once again, this is something that is uh, supporting destruction. Uh, it is that simple. Healthy soils have humus and vegetation cover to survive. We need to feed humus and keep our planet green. That is more beautiful too. So I like areas that have lush vegetation, forests and so on. And that's the thing. Either 60 harvests left uh, and regenerative agriculture. Now, uh, next step. All right, now to soil vegetation systems. Uh, the humus uh, ecosystem is at the heart of all soil life and basically on all so life on land uh, on Earth. And uh, humus is so important in so many aspects. So we will have uh, reduced erosion, good yields and healthy crops, aeration of the soil. And um, if humus is well fed, it feeds the plants. It is a storage system and slow release of nutrients and carbon. It's improving the water cycle. It's improving water storage. And it's a biofilter for groundwater and it allows the groundwater uh, to be recharged through living soil uh, as opposite to dead soil. Now, um, what is humus? Uh, so very often um, only uh, soil carbon is measured and that's good because you can well see quite a bit of that. But if you want to look further into the whole uh, intrinsic uh, ecosystem, of course, we should see more. So um, large parts of the soil are water, air and mineral substance. And as you hopefully know, the minerals are uh, sand, silt and uh, clay elements. And to have at least some clay is important for uh, a good productive soil. Uh, just sand is uh, a real problem, but can improve, be improved very well. Soils that are uh, not drying again, so that are kept wet and become very uh, difficult to be worked, they can be a real problem. Uh, and But all can be improved by um, the humus. So now the organic uh, content of this is here. And if we blow that up, uh, that breaks down to uh, the humus itself, the organic substance. So, um, and organic substance, as an example, 7%, many farmers would be happy for that. So many farms are below 1%, what is a near death uh, value, uh, death of the soil. And uh, then of the uh, organic substance, there is uh, roughly 85% um, in the form of humus. 
but then there is also the 10% uh, of uh, roots of the plants and uh, that is of course a well just an estimation because that differs from soil to soil and with 7% organic we have a living soil here in this example and uh, then and this is a very important uh, fraction there is the edaphone uh, and that's the uh, the soil life, uh, the macro life and the micro life. And if we move to the breakdown for the living uh, uh, entities in the soil, we see that we have uh, uh, the realm of the bacteria, microorganisms, uh, fungi and algae in a good soil, as I said, the degraded soils uh, with very little organic compounds to have near nothing uh, and very importantly the earthworms um, all right so um, and there is great publications by Annie Francais Harar professor Harar was a soil scientist and uh, they work together and they have written uh, thick books about soil life absolutely great even today and um, there is also uh, experience with very high contents of uh, organic matter, not seven or six, but 65 and 20% of soil life. But that is something you can only achieve in uh, gardening operations. That's not really feasible um, on large plots of land in um, large scale agriculture. Uh, now, um, that's how well relatively dead soil is uh, looking uh, productivity is going down and eventually ending that's the story of 60 harvests left and this soil if it rains this will be running off and turning brown and that means that the well um, soil is getting less and less the topsoil the productive topsoil and if you take this soil into your hand you realize right away there's something wrong there's no aggregates it's just powdery and um, that makes irrigation necessary in very many instances and uh, on the contrary if you have a healthy soil with with the vegetation cover uh, then the water will just infiltrate. So if rain is falling, it is uh, infiltrating and not running off uh, even up to 150 liters per uh, square meter uh, pour down. That is, well, hardly existing, but it's like if that happens, uh, a healthy soil can just uh, take that up while in other places with dead soil there may be major floodings with lives lost with uh, roads uh, destroyed and houses breaking uh, so that's really uh, important and one other thing to remember is that through the plant we, we we do have a completely different situation so soil without vegetation cover um, so the the plant uh, root interaction is called the rhizosphere and uh, the soil is changed by plant growth and uh, uh, the roots and otherwise it is um, uh, like a sponge soaks up the rain and makes up for good storage holds water much longer into the dry season but non rhizospheric soil uh, is compacted, flooding, erosion. So when it rains, it's just running off, becoming brown. And here it soaks in and stays there for longer and is replenishing the groundwater. And uh, many trees and plants, you will have a good soil structure. And then there is this splash effect. Uh, if the soil is bare for too often, uh, the raindrops beating are compacting the soil further and then we have all this uh, runoff. Um, now there is an experiment on um, yeah, well, how infiltration can be done. And um, 
I will show you an example and I will try to make this without uh, causing damage here in my place. Um, so if we have um, Um, a soil that is living, as I said, infiltration goes easily. So it's cooling the ground that supports plant growth, uh, slow long-term evaporation, making new clouds, and that is helping for a balanced climate. In these areas, there is fast evaporation and then nothing else left to uh, form clouds and the region is drying out hot ground and in hot ground even above 40 degrees celsius plant growth is stopping so the what we have in many many areas of the around the world so if if the soil is not having good vegetation cover it will be sort of stopping to produce um, now mm, once again uh, the plant roots are very, very important. And this is a picture of, um, well, how big the, the roots are in the soil. Just compare this to the, to the plant. And um, now I want to uh, show you a bit about the, um, uh, the experiments by, um, uh, well, for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, David Johnson from uh, New Mexico State University, and he's working with uh, the famous Dr. Elaine Ingham, uh, who is really, really very well known uh, among the progressive or the, well, the, the, the caring farmers around the world. And um, they have found that if we have a low uh, ratio of uh, bacteria to uh, so in the lower part of the graph uh, fungi to bacteria ratios uh, 0 0.0101 uh, this is something we find typically in um, uh, uh, grain fields and, and or, or, or uh, mice fields corn fields and uh, this is ideal for weeds and so it's really strange that many soils are in a range of uh, fungi to bacterial uh, ratio that is ideal for uh, for wheat growth. For the successional grasses and uh, the row crops, the, the, the grain and so on, uh, a fungi to bacterial uh, level of one to one is necessary. And so that supports the crop and discourages uh, the, the undergrowth. Um, so uh, Dr. Johnson has um, shown that there is no direct correlation between plant growth and nitrogen. So basically plant growth is like this and uh, nitrogen is like this so the highest nitrogen is well not having all that much of a yield uh, same for uh, the the phosphate at peak phosphate contents very low yield and with the nitrogen here is no mineral uh, nitrogen but highest yields, and there is a connection there because the, the uh, mineral uh, nitrogen, water soluble nitrogen, is detrimental to soil health and the soil life. Same for potassium, and so we see very much potassium here. Um, but the super growth you only get when you have the soil right and not when you put just minerals on the soil to the contrary. And then Dr. Johnson thought, okay, and I would have made the same guess, obviously, uh, the organic matter in the soil. But once again, uh, the highest organic matter was not really meeting the highest yields. And then he was, uh, well, finding something that is absolutely stunning. And 
pretty new. I think many people don't really know this. Uh, maybe Elaine Ingham has this right since a long time, but I was really surprised. And so we have an excellent correlation from the yields um, to the fungal to bacteria ratio. So that's a very uh, good indicator. And by the way, not much looked at normally. It's not that easy to determine, uh, but um, it seems that there is something about that. Um, and um, Dr. Johnson and uh, his wife, uh, Ms. Sue, they have developed the Johnson Sue no turn composting bioreactor. Uh, there is a link to their videos. It's also below uh, this video and in the, in the slides. Um, and they make a compost that is absolutely aerobic because like there is a lot of uh, pipes in there that can be drawn later on. Then they fill it with a lot of organic matter, including um, also leaf and uh, cow dung and uh, a lot of good stuff. And uh, then they leave this for um, extended periods of time. And so they saw that after four weeks, uh, they had um, identified, uh, Johnson is a soil micro, uh, is a bio, uh, microbiologist working on soil since a long time. And uh, he found 316 of 740 species that they were uh, able to identify. And the interesting thing is that they had very uh, few organisms that were absolutely dominating the whole story. Now, after um, 22 weeks, there were already 424 of the 740 species. And you see that the, the uh, these uh, pies here are shrinking. Still one very dominant, and um, that is the phase where normally the compost would be brought to the field. And by the way, normal compost, aerobic compost, is often turned over again and again and again. And this, this is discouraging the, the growth of fungi because you break the mycelium. And so that's why they don't turn, but keep it aerobic uh, by these uh, holes in the compost. So they don't need to touch it. That saves a lot of labor, saves energy, and saves the fungi that we want to enhance. And uh, so that's the stunning thing, absolutely amazing. So this is world-class discovery. It's absolutely amazing. And um, so they find that um, there are a lot more, uh, well, balanced uh, well, species. So, so it's like there is no um, dominating pie anymore. So it's uh, so many uh, species in here that are uh, in a good distribution and um, well like uh, 60 weeks is a bit over a year and so you can run a yearly cycle uh, or a, a two-year cycle in this and uh, people who know about composting and compost demand in, in large-scale agriculture they would say, oh, this is impossible, we can't compost so long. But wait, just hold on for a moment. Because there is uh, the experience um, that he has uh, brought in um, these uh, composts uh, finally in very, very small amounts. And this is uh, just one kilogram per hectare uh, it's diluted in 100 liters of water. You can put it in while you're um, seeding into the seeding machines. They have such things for uh, adding fertilizer, but much better you add the whole inoculum because now with this compost, there is a lot of fungal spores uh, that you bring out with the seed. And when the seed is developing, uh, boom, you will see um, that there is the... Um, uh, 
root uh, mycorrhiza interaction right away, or the seed um, well interaction with the um, with the uh, developing uh, uh, plant, um, and um, to I just had a few days back. I had a discussion with. Uh, Jan Wibbing, who is a great researcher in the field of improving agricultural soils by uh, mycorrhizal fungi and others. And he has also done the project, our project in Ethiopia, the Abba Minch project, uh, restoration project. And uh, when I discussed this issue with him, he said, well, but the mycorrhizal fungi uh, cannot survive in such a compost. Um, because um, even if you don't turn it, there are no plants. So mycorrhizal fungi will only multiply in a uh, system where plants are growing. Uh, and so that's why I think we should combine with another great um, well, researcher, uh, and that is Dan Kittredge. And he is a well. He, he knows the work of uh, Professor Wilhelm Albrecht. He has worked a lot with trace elements and had great success on his organic uh, farm, uh, organic gardening he's doing. And um, he grew up on that farm, and so he was uh, hating it because there was so much work. But once he started to improve soil life, to bring back all the trace elements. Uh, and to enhance the biology, uh, he had easy life. So he can do lots of presentations and still has a very healthy farm, very productive. The farm is earning money and so on. And so that's something uh, wonderful experience that shows that these things are really working out in the practice of people that have a lot of knowledge. Dan has grown up on an organic farm, so he knows what he's doing. And uh, so he developed a method of well, creating an inoculum. And as I told you, um, the Johnson Sioux compost is more an inoculum, but most probably lacking the mycorrhizal fungi. I would like to discuss this. Um, so, David, whenever you see this, uh, reach out. Um, I've sent you a few emails without response so far. I think he's in the field all the time researching. Um, and um, so um, let's discuss this. So how can we get the mycorrhizal fungi into the system? And Dan Kittredge found a great method in this. And well, other experienced people have, have done similar things. So. Dan is saying he's um, driving around the farm and region and looks as, at as many different uh, ecosystems as possible. And then he looks for those plots or spaces uh, where the plants are really, really growing well. So real deep, deep dark uh, green leaf, uh, ideally with a wax cover. So that's sign for very, very healthy plant that can defend easily against pests. Uh, because if plants are eaten by pests, these plants are not healthy. So they lack trace elements. They may lack some uh, type of uh, soil fungi or some um, enzyme in the soil that is only there if you have inoculated with a specific uh, uh, microbial life. And so he puts all this into a bucket and uh, just a small amount from each space. And uh, then when he has gathered all what, what he thinks suitable, he goes back to the farm and will uh, do the same that uh, Johnson uh, is doing with his uh, compost. He is mixing this with water and making it an inoculum. And uh, that should be combined with Johnson Sioux compost, in my point of view, because then we have the best of the two worlds, the natural world and the like the development in a uh, in this type of uh, static compost. Um, and so that can be really changing soil in a in a very short uh, time span. So that's absolutely 
great that this is <clears throat> available and uh, yeah with this uh, I want to um, Ah, one, one more word. So Dr. Johnson has worked with large scale farms and uh, one stunning experiment, and you see that in the video that is homework, part of this lecture, um, he could um, convince a conventional farmer with huge uh, field uh, to well, make three parts of his land and one part was just getting the mineral fertilizer and all the treatments like everything else. Uh, another plot was receiving only 25% of the fertilizer and uh, the one kilogram per hectare in 100 liters of water uh, of uh, the Johnson uh, inoculum. And the third plot was only getting Johnson inoculum without any mineral fertilizer. And now um, the farmer was really stunned when the yield was uh, almost the same in all plots and was asking, why am I adding mineral fertilizer? And Johnson said, well, I don't know either. <laughs> As a microbiologist, soil microbiologist, uh, he knew that this is uh, detrim detrimental to the, to the soil life and not helping soil plant or plant growth. Of course, you need nitrogen, but you need nitrogen that is sort of produced in the system itself uh, by uh, legumes and by, by all the soil life itself. We don't need bloody factories for that. It's, it's, it's just a natural thing. And to replace something natural by an industry, um, that is, of course, only interesting for those running the industry, but uh, destructive for the whole system. All right, so um, that is very hopeful, and I don't say this will work everywhere right away, so it needs to be applied in a proper way and to apply these things in the in the local context of your specific farm with the specific crops people want to grow, the um, soil type, um, uh, sand, uh, silt, uh, and, and clay, and so on, and the existing soil life, and so on. Uh, but it's showing a clear way how farmers can progress and many farmers have shown that this works very well indeed. Research needed. Uh, another great person who has found through um, experience, so this guy, uh, John Kempf, he has grown up on a conventional gardening operation um, and uh, one day he or one year he experienced when the family uh, was um, renting another plot of land uh, just besides their own heavily agrochemically treated land. Father was dealer for this stuff. Um, then only he realized how much better the yield was without any uh, of the well, biocides they added. And uh, then he realized, okay, there is something uh, to the soil life. And he worked on a lot on the trace elements and he made this plant health pyramid. That's absolutely stunning. So look that up. There is the website here, Advancing Eco Agriculture. And uh, he has quite a few great uh, interviews also in uh, YouTube. And um, basically he's saying, um, from a lot of experience. His company, he set up a company for that that's very, very successful. He, he has a lot of employees and thing is running very, very well. First, you must make sure to have complete photosynthesis and that requires magnesium, uh, iron, manganese, nitrogen and phosphate. Then for complete uh, protein synthesis, once again, the magnesium, but also sulfur. Now the molybdenum on and boron. And remember, boron is missing in one third of all arable land around the world. So that those plants will be stopped here. And so with that, you would not get good yields. Plants would be ill and require biocides. But when you have all that, the plant can develop very well, but then you must take care as uh, the upper level 
for the soil uh, biology. And this will be um, well also in two steps, but that's basically what we've seen with the work of uh, Johnson and Kittredge and uh, Ingham and uh, many others who are sort of promoting uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, then um, a few words about the work of uh, Dr. Stefan Hügel. Uh, he has done the doctorate on uh, the already mentioned floating plant aquaculture and after his doctorate he moved into working on minerals because he saw how important, how crucially important this is for all production in agriculture, aquaculture, in human health and so on. And there is a, um, well, uh, some literature he was digging out. He's working day and night on these issues and he is world-class researcher in this field and they are doing experiments now. But this is an experiment um, that he has uh, taken from literature, so I, I took that from him. Um, there is uh, this, um, like what you learn in uh, every biology lesson, that there are essential and non-essential trace elements. And uh, basically, that is all bullshit. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's so crazy because a lot of stuff that is essential for health of plants, health, uh, human health, so like lithium and all these things, um, if that is considered not essential, then, then this is stupid. And now chromium, not considered essential, what is the effect of chromium? So chromium addition to avocado cultivation. And this is the chromium addition, zero, up to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of soil. And uh, you see that there is obviously too much. And there is a good range where, well, things work out very well and the plants develop maybe not even double, but, but almost double the height. And uh, this is only one of maybe 80 elements to be considered. So then uh, this is experiments now on the research side of um, the uh, IMKF, uh, Institute of Mineral uh, Loop uh, Research or Mineral uh, Cycle Research. Uh, website is below. It's, it's still in the beginning. So this institute was founded only last year and uh, so often people are saying, uh, well, but we have compost and that has all the trace elements. And so they did a Kinsey uh, soil analysis. That's a good way of soil analysis, analysis. and uh, because they look at very many elements. Uh, and uh, so, um, okay, for boron, true, the compost had a lot, but for copper, um, even the soil that was not really enriched uh, until then had more copper than the compost. Uh, and well, the same is true for uh, some other stuff. So cobalt here is lower in the compost. And uh, so there is uh, things to be considered. Also the iron was much higher in, in the soil than in the compost. And if you have iron deficiency and you put compost with too little iron, even less iron, you will destroy your system. All right, so uh, now the question is, and that's the question that uh, Stefan is, is asking. And I took this knowledge from him. I learned a lot from him. He's a great researcher, absolutely world class in this uh, mineral uh, trace element issue, plant health issue, and also has a great knowledge of plants and uh, like uh, also health uh, issues. So um, absolutely stunning what he's doing. And so the question is how to compensate. And with that, I want to uh, show you uh, now if that would be my cultivation. So 
This, for example, is uh, uh, um, yeah, it's it's uh, the a health plant. I, I won't read the Latin name here. Uh, I'm not into that. Um, but so we could add minerals now in a way of putting some powder. And this is now a real application because this is the mineral mix that um, Stefan Hügel has developed. And normally I put this into my drinking water in uh, suitable amounts. But that would be one way to put this into the soil. The plant could take up those elements. Um, the downside of this is that, um, of course, um, the plant would um, not get all of that because a lot of these elements would be absorbing to the clay particles and so on. So the other way is uh, spraying and uh, and uh, that would a treatment of uh, the leaf of the plant and the leaf um, can take uh, up the elements very easily and it goes directly into the plant the plant just takes uh, as much as it can and uh, with that the plant can be even rescued if it's falling ill you can see this uh, leaf color and leaf form and so on you can detect deficiencies and even plants that were sort of written off by the farmer could be rescued by spray with uh, specific elements. Also for biogas plants at, at my institute, there were experiments done uh, with um, putting some trace elements into a biogas reactor and the biogas production was uh, well, strongly rising in, 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 in some cases. So also there were deficiencies in trace elements. And this is basically the application of the teachings of Professor Albrecht from 100 years back. So why is this not everywhere so far? It's crazy. People have to take their fate into their own hands. They cannot rely on professionals that are earning from ill-defined systems and will not earn any more when they uh, bring in uh, natural systems. And one word about uh, uh, hydro uh, cultivation uh, or putting these nutrients and elements into the irrigation water, that does not work well because that's sort of force feeding and you cannot find the right amounts. So leaf spray is something good and then if you apply this over and over again, your compost will be enriched, excreta of humans will be enriched, people will be healthier and uh, so that would be starting an uh, upward cycle. All right, so then let's go further. Um, and this is something about uh, the connection of the mycorrhiza and um, the work of uh, Dr. Jan Rübing. He did the doctorate. Uh, the link uh, will be put below. And uh, this is uh, where something stunning is, is there. So for nitrogen, we see that um, you just need to make soils healthy again and you won't need the nitrogen, adding as mineral nitrogen. Because the, well, the soil life and uh, plants, not only legumes, many, many plants can do that. Many uh, good soils can do that. Uh, if molybdenum is there, of course, and probably also some other conditions, moisture must always be there, otherwise everything is stopping. Um, so uh, Jan has uh, described in his research um, that the phosphate reserves that are in many, many soils around the world, uh, they can last for sometimes hundreds of years if you enrich mycorrhizal fungi because those will access those uh, phosphate in the soil that are there naturally or from uh, a type of agriculture that is not really 
uh, efficient. So a lot of phosphate is getting lost to the plants, bound by calcium, for example, in like Middle East countries where the soils are very calcined. So the phosphate just binds to um, calcium and it's not accessible to plants so easily anymore. But the mycorrhizal fungi, they can easily break this up and even uh, iron phosphate, they can break that up, what a plant normally couldn't do. And so this would be um, bringing the uh, phosphate back in the system, into the system. And uh, the iron is also used. So two very beneficial elements can be broken up only by the mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungi and other fungi, uh, uh, probably. Um, yeah, so and now um, we should add the findings um, of uh, Johnson Sue with the Johnson Sue compost, um, the Kittredge uh, knowledge, and the work of John Kempf uh, and now also Stefan Hügel um, into making an uh, inoculum for arable land. And all this stuff is very cheap because you don't need big uh, amounts, uh, but you have to keep the system healthy then. So vegetation cover year round and so on, uh, not plowing because then you destroy the mycorrhizal fungi. You can like grubber, that's just touching the first few centimeters on the top, that's doable. But um, that's something what um, can make soil life improve year after year. The yields will improve, uh, less uh, biocides uh, needed and so on. So how can you determine um, the content of um, elements in the soil? And uh, you can make an indirect test with this uh, refractometer. Uh, the BRICS readings are correlating to nutrient density and taste. It's used in uh, vineyards to look how much sugar is there, but it's, it's measuring the whole nutrient density in the plant. So very important also for our own food that it has a high nutrient density. Um, and this is, well, a not so expensive, I think, such a unit costs uh, like less than a hundred euros or dollars and so that's very doable and of course you have to get experience with the readings but you can then distinguish between a good carrot and a bad carrot so good carrots will be um, where are they up here and bad carrots will be up there and i promise you those higher readings will usually uh, be the more tasty ones, and those are the ones that keep you healthy. Um, then um, back to the results of uh, Dr. Johnson. So this is just to illustrate how tremendously successful this was. So uh, the uh, uh, fungi to uh, bacteria ratio, if it's very low, low yield, and if it's high, enormous yields. So that was the direct correlation that was uh, what I have shown before in the graph. And uh, Dr. Jürgen Rekin, who has deceased unfortunately last year, but at very high age, and uh, Jürgen was setting up an experiment. So there is uh, one big pot, and there is, you can imagine, it looks like, like this, so better like this. Uh, and there is two types of soil in the same pot. And on one hand, there is, on one side here, is soil with NPK, mineral fertilizer, nitrogen phosphate, potassium, um, and all trace elements in optimum supply, what you never find in, uh, well, mineral uh, fertilizers. They often don't add anything, just maybe a few that are really, really lacking so hard that nothing else grows. Uh, but then on the other side, there is um, some leaf marsh on top um, and then soil with stone, uh, stone dust, rock dust, volcanic rock dust and plenty of humus. And now we can uh, experience what the plant prefers. 
and uh, going there we see it's very very clear convincing isn't it and um, Hervik Pommeresche he's an architect and uh, permaculture guy living in South Norway and he could uh, he applied these things very high content of uh, humus uh, with feeding the soil life very very heavily with uh, fresh organic stuff directly from the kitchen grinding it and so on uh, there is a short video very popular one uh, that we done that we have done from the institute on his work and have a look at that really stunning and he's producing 18 kilograms of onions per square meter over many years the normal yield in that region is three kilograms per square meter both for organic and for agrochemical uh, gardens and uh, so when I heard about these things and read his book, uh, Humusphäre, uh, it's only available in uh, Norwegian and Engl uh, German, unfortunately. Uh, but the, the, the gist of it is in the, in the video. Um, and uh, I was giving a presentation once at a, a University for Agriculture, and uh, there were many proponents of the uh, agrochemical model so those researchers researching in that field they are completely into this and they do not like to hear something like this so so they got really upset and they were saying well but but well, why only three kilograms so normally if we do, do everything with our chemicals we reach nine kilograms per square meter um, i think i didn't answer to that command just gave them a smile um, and uh, but it's basically it's if people are in a bubble and they only talk to people that are reflecting their own point of view and the whole thing is in a bubble that is biased because they only earn money if they keep this uh, stuff up and even call it science uh, basically it's very high-tech science work included no no worries about that but uh, what about researching something that is ill-defined from the beginning? Go away, move away, move out from that. People, we need you. If you are good researchers, we are needing you in, in this field. But you have to well find, them, find something for yourself. So this is not coming easily with a job description and a fixed salary. So you have to build up your things. Uh, but that will be a lot more rewarding at the end of the day. Not, not finding out when you're aging that you have sort of helped destroying humankind. Uh, there is one thing that is also hardly known um, and that's called endocytosis with plants. So the roots can sort of move inwards and then they can sort of eat uh, bacteria, protozoa and, and bacteria and um, that is something that was published um, in, in some uh, more or less uh, non-scientific book but um, later research has shown that this is absolutely right so in PLOS one peer-reviewed with, with very respected institutes uh, turning the table plants consume microbes as a source of nutrients so sorry those uh, vegans and uh, vegetarians um, plants are not vegetarian so um, that whole concept uh, must be rethought and of course i wouldn't eat meat from animals that have been well uh, coming from from industrial uh, production sites with with uh, absolutely incredible uh, terrible situations very often and animals that are killed in in absolute uh, horror and the horror the hormones for the horror go into the meat and make people like uh, anxious or aggressive or like depressed and um, this is just some personal view so that's I, I don't want to claim that this is uh, scientifically proven um, i would have to find um, those links but it's something what is sort of unacceptable anyway um, so they could find out that microbes uh, like 
uh, yeast and uh, also E. coli and I think it was also um, uh, salmonella were moving inside the root hairs and roots um, alive. <laughs> so eating the soil life alive. Now, uh, hope you're still with me. So this is running long, but uh, the upside of video is that you can stop um, at uh, any time. And uh, so I'll, I'll just keep running because like uh, it's, it's um, easier if you want to continue. And I always recommend uh, to stop roughly every 20 minutes and to recap what you have learned because then it will get into long-term memory. All right, proven solutions for large-scale farming. Um, good soils makes good soil if it's well fed. Luckily, the uh, um, arable land under organic cultivation is growing, but still at a very low uh, rate. But a lot of agriculture is going regenerative agriculture and not even bothering with, with uh, doing all this stuff for getting certified. So they do proper agriculture without using uh, biocides and, and mineral fertilizers, at least in, um, only in emergency situations, maybe. So the situation is much better than we would think because it's spreading so fast. Um, is organic agriculture good enough? And basically there is no general answer because many, many conventional farms do work fairly well. Many organic ones don't. Uh, industrial organic agriculture is growing, lowest price, lowest standards. So that's something what I don't like. They do the same mistakes that the, um, well, now still prevailing, but well, uh, disappearing industrial uh, farming approach does. Uh, and most importantly, most organic farms do still plow and do not manage to build humus because they destroy the fungi. And many organic farms do not look for 80 plus elements that are needed uh, to be available for healthy plants. Um, then about the myth that organic farms are producing less. They may be producing less if they are not well managed uh, or if their soils are very, very difficult and not built up. So far, many will still do plowing so they don't get nowhere with that because like if you still keep plowing, you, you, you are not gaining um, organic matter very much. And the Rodale Institute in the USA um, that is uh, researching this since decades, the same farm cut to half, one does chemical farming, the other one organic farming. The yields almost the same. Wow, what do we always hear? Uh, and now for those among you that may be farmers or linked to farmers, the total profits dollar per hectare and year, organic farm, much higher. And why is that? While the yields are the same almost, of course, a lot less inputs, so they don't need the expensive mineral fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and chemical farms need to spray more and more and more because of the resistances. And one day you have the super weeds and no, herbic no herbicide works anymore and um, uh, they bring more and more toxic chemicals in to fight that, but it's a, it's a losing game, 60 harvests left. And it makes less money for the uh, farmer. And of course, well, that's partly because money is abstracted from outside. So the rural areas that are under chemical farming will usually not be very wealthy at least not from the farming side. And very interestingly, energy usage is significantly lower. And now I don't know if they do no plow, but if they do no plow, it's probably going down a lot. 
Um, all right, so um, is organic um, agriculture good enough? Part two, uh, the principles of uh, regenerative agriculture with good humus levels should be applied by all farms. 100% uh, regenerative and 100% free of substances that can't be proven to be safe is the most reasonable goal for all. Uh, education and building uh, local experience with diverse crops is key. So the principles are relatively simple to learn, but application in a specific site are really, really difficult. So I have a lot of uh, awe for the farmers that are managing to survive in these circumstances with a pretty disrupted agricultural system with, with soils that have been degraded uh, for a long time, with climate uh, going crazy and going crazy because of this type of farming to quite a, 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 quite an extent. And um, now to well the more details of regenerative agriculture. So we have learned a lot on that already, but now we go more into the details what will be done. No tilling. Run machines in the same track all year. Uh, cover soil all year with green manual legumes, deep and shallow rooted multi-species mixes. That is very, very successful. There are many people having great success with that since, well, many, many years. Direct seeding into the flattened green manure and include animals in way of rotational grazing. So instead of flattening the green manure, you can also graze it with like uh, rotational grazing methods. Do clever crop rotation, uh, but if the soil is really absolutely healthy, you can stop crop rotation. So if uh, crop rotation is sort of showing that the soil is not treated in a right way, if you um, treat the soil in a proper way, you don't need to rotate anymore. And that's quite a bold statement, I know, and uh, I'm not sure if this is applying everywhere. So bear with me bear with me that we don't have all that much experience but i heard from people who have done this over decades dan kittredge is having the same experience i know somebody in in this region here where i have my piece of land and uh, this guy was always tell, also telling me that his father has managed his land in this way in the gardening operation and was very successful with that and um, then um, Adapted local seeds, maximize diversity, agroforestry with food and uh, also leguminous trees like alder and um, a few others, not, not that many. Uh, remember for the tropical, subtropicals, uh, Moringa does also produce a lot of nitrogen, not a legume in the textbooks. And many plants can do that that are not legumes in the textbooks. Those textbooks are outdated in many aspects. Introduce and protect mycorrhizal fungi if missing. That would be the Kittredge method of inoculation. Building humus and you have a manifold higher uh, water uptake and retention. Um, the soil health principles are teached by, uh, among others, but he is a pioneer in this, Ray Archuleta. And great video, and um, I will put the link below. So this is also part of the homework. And it's not in the slides, uh, forgot that, but it's like I pu I'll put it below the video. Right, I have to take note on that. Um, So um, they have done experiments with water from tilled soil and uh, no till. And basically you can see that the tilled soil doesn't have structure while it's, it's just resolving. And that means erosion. It means the water is sort of destroying the, the topsoil and so on. And uh, on the other hand here, uh, this one, no till, the soil stays there and uh, the water just goes through. They have put the same amounts of water. Look at that, it's, it's stunning. And then uh, 
another one of my uh, hero heroes is Gabe Brown. So he was really uh, he has a great book um, and uh, uh, he, he's absolutely uh, uh, amazing in, in what he has managed to do. He was facing bankruptcy with his large scale farm, 2000 hectares. Just imagine that is absolutely huge, but in one of the most difficult climates of the world, North Dakota in the US. And he has managed to survive, not only survive, but to thrive through getting away from plowing. He was working with Rhea Trulita and um, the, well, the result of all that is uh, that he has really uh, grown um, soil organic matter from like 4% um, uh, to 4.3% from formerly 1.6%. So 1.6 is what most agrochemical soils will have. And then he has, uh, no, this, uh, I, I mixed that up. Um, that would be forest soil. So just as a, uh, a comparison. Um, and here he's showing the, the loss and uh, he's also showing, and he does that on his large scale farm, that he is moving up this way with no till and uh, reducing on uh, agrochemicals, and that he could build up to the same amounts like uh, forest soil and even more. So, building 5% uh, of uh, soil organic matter over 10 years' time absolutely stunning i don't say you you will reach this everywhere but he's not the only one many followed his example and were successful even if you just make uh, half of that is absolutely stunning and opens the way to a great future for the farm and um, applied globally great future for humankind uh, no more climate change from the side of destroyed soils and that the biggest contributions by humans uh, most probably and so on. So uh, now this experiment um, and uh, the dead soil as here will be like a roof tile while a healthy soil uh, is like a sponge and I want to show you in uh, this example and uh, let me show you this little experiment because it's very instructive so this is something i usually do in in class so i have a uh, well destroyed soil and uh, i have some equipment or from the kitchen basically that produces some rain so bear with me if this is not really working out uh, in a in an ideal way uh, but let me turn it this way that you see the runoff better. So now um, let me produce some rain and let, watch out for the runoff. Hopefully don't destroy my computer here. So you see the rain is over and the water is already gone. So that's the surface of a uh, destroyed soil and now if we cover the bad soil with a vegetation cover and healthy soil um, we can do the same experiment with the rain um, and um, so the rain is coming and and there is no runoff yet. And uh, so this is soaking up the rain. And if it rains more, it slowly runs off. And uh, but then it keeps running. So it's like distributing the water over a long time span. And this is something that we see in uh, healthy soil so it keeps the water and um, with the dead soil not having any water after the rain uh, this living soil has 
plenty, plenty, plenty. And all that is uh, trickling through now, so it, it feeds the plants for weeks if the soil is really good, and it will replenish the groundwater and eventually flow into a river like the one behind me, River Alster here, and uh, the rivers will be having water all year if the catchment area is having good soil with vegetation cover. Forests, good arable land, and um, so on. All right, so hopefully this is something that is um, <laughs> visible in some extent. I would really prefer to teach in the classroom, but with this we have the lecture public, what has its upsides in itself. So spread the word if you like the more presentation. And um, moving on, uh, this is the farm of um, Gabe Brown and uh, he has, uh, well, managed to get from bankruptcy into being very profitable, even on 2,000 hectares. And he's now uh, talking about reducing uh, the size of his land because he doesn't need that much land for having a, a, a decent income. So then uh, the holistic plant grazing, that is Gabe Brown is also applying that. You saw that in the last picture. So the herd animals um, are really uh, kept into um, in um, one um, plot. And so they graze this plot, then they move to the next one. No, it's, it's sort of not a good trip. This, this picture is not very well done, I have to admit. Um, the small plots, so normally the whole land is open for grazing or traditionally in Germany they do like this, uh, but you do a, a much finer grid of plots. So the animals are all kept here and when they have grazed down all that, at the next morning the gate is opened and they run with joy into the next plot and um, so this is where animals are kept outside. They eat local food. They, look, they eat uh, grass that humans can't eat. And um, also they are making food production possible in large areas of the world where you cannot grow uh, grain or vegetables. And um, so this is something that is absolutely great system. And uh, he's criticized heavily because there are always people that don't want to believe or that are jealous or that are uh, invested in uh, business that would be gone. So it's in, in these things, there's always big business disappearing to the benefit of society. So we don't need business that is uh, destroying our future and, and bringing cruelty into into our planet by mistreating animals. When you ever see uh, these animals, the grazing animals being outside and uh, having, having a joy of life, living a natural life, that's the only way how we can ever justify to eat animals if we want to. If we treat them badly, um, there is that should be stopped. That is, uh, in so far, I've been vegetarian for 15 years of my life. It wasn't really good for me because um, it's I, I'm, I'm I'm sort of protein person. Uh, but uh, the arguments were for industrial meat production, and if we keep animals in a way that they enjoy their life, they get good food, they have a. a, a peaceful environment and, and interact with their um, other animals. They live longer in such operations, of course, not these extremely short, horrible lifestyles in, uh, in the big cages with thousands and thousands of animals. And um, this is something to think about. So we need animals to restore the planet. We need animals to restore the planet. I repeat this because we are hammered with nonsense like animals are destroying the future. Only wrong managed animals, there I agree, but you mustn't manage them wrongly. Uh, you should just go for proper management of animals. Uh, well, this is an extreme form of uh, 
the uh, rotational grazing, but high density is what we want and herd animals enjoy that. Um, this is the um, one uh, well, other video of, of Gabe Brown and this is his book Dirt to Soil and it's not a like boring science book it's really fantastic uh, experience a great life <coughs> and a life well lived I have to say and he's still giving presentations and still improving his son has joined him and uh, it's a pattern that <coughs> those farmers that are doing great stuff their children want to take the farms over yeah also in germany there is uh, interessengemeinschaft gesunder boden and um, there is the farmer josef Häkler, for example he is doing what gabe brown and others are doing in the us in a in a very successful way uh, north america is years and years ahead because of those pioneers and the ignorance of our policies um, and there are uh, great videos uh, in German um, by by this organization so please join in there also like uh, available to do master thesis with them uh, and so we should get from the plow dead soil to no plow direct seeding soils and uh, the good structure of the soil we have visited the farm of Josef Hägler in southern Germany near Nuremberg and I could distinguish the soil without looking so if you had the soil in your hand you saw what his plot was and the directly neighboring plot that was uh, plowed and getting chemicals he's, he's organic so he combines this with organic what is not so easy especially to start with better to convert to no uh, no till uh, and then eventually go to organic so uh, rice is the most uh, water consuming uh, crop and it's the main staple food worldwide it's uh, eating up around 50% uh, of all the water usage of uh, agriculture uh, what is 80% of all water consumption, fresh water consumption in the world, and that makes it uh, the most waste water wasting plant. It can be submerged but doesn't really like it. And if you go for dry rice cultivation, like in the system of rice intensification, uh, SRI, uh, the plants will grow really, really big and um, and around 20 years back I met uh, Professor Dr. Mubiar uh, from ITB Bandung, the big technical university of Indonesia and he was supporting the research on uh, this dry rice system, SRI system. It was support, de uh, developed in uh, Madagascar and uh, is supported since like uh, 40 years around uh, by Cornell University in uh, the US and uh, I was happy enough to run into it in Indonesia when I was there for more for uh, wastewater projects uh, um, and uh, so they showed me uh, one of the fields there and they are uh, making wider spacing so that the plant can really develop this brings more yield they take compost so each plant gets a bit of compost and here you can see the compost heap lots of worms in their soil life and um, in the upper corner there is the the farmer the one in the uniform he's at, in the military at the same time and running his farm and his farm was the only one that survived severe floodings that were uh, had happened just before i arrived and only the dry rice could stand the, dry, uh, the, the flooding. It was quite surprising to me. Um, and uh, it has a lot of upsides. And so uh, I had that in mind 20 years later uh, when um, Tafsif Shah from uh, Kashmir was uh, 
well, graduating at THH. Uh, and uh, he was uh, letting me know he wanted to do a, a doctorate. And uh, so uh, when we were looking for a topic, I was asking him, what's the most pressing problem in your country? And uh, he said uh, pretty much straight away, uh, the rice farming is in big distress because uh, through droughts, uh, government is saying you can't grow rice anymore, but rice is all people eat, all they grow as staple food. And so farmers didn't follow. And um, that's something what uh, is risking the future of the whole region. And so I remembered uh, the SRI system, system of rice intensification, what I experienced in uh, Indonesia. So I told him about that. And even though he's from a rice producing uh, region, um, he didn't know that. So it's not very well known so far, even though there are a few hundred thousand more farmers doing this in um, Indonesia, uh, also in uh, some other uh, East and Southeast Asian countries, but it's by far not widespread enough. And there's one reason, because the undergrowth is, well, making it uh, more labor. And so I gave Tafsif the, shaf, uh, the, 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 the task uh, to improve the system in a way that it would be more productive. And uh, he researched on this, and he came up with uh, what we now call I-crop uh, or I-rice, intercropping rice. Um, and uh, he was intercropping um, with legumes, with beans in this case, because it's also a food plant uh, commonly known in that area. And with that, the whole SRI system was far better and it was sort of, um, well, also eliminating the uh, well, demand for uh, nitrogen from outside uh, and it was also um, turning out unexpectedly we have to admit um, that through the uh, beans that were growing between the rows uh, this was um, like uh, overgrowing uh, the, um, the weeds easily and so after uh, the planting of the rice and a few days later seeding the beans together with one weeding, uh, the beans would develop in a way that you wouldn't have to weed uh, very much anymore. And that is a major advantage for the system. So uh, by this research, Tafsi found a solution to one of the most pressing water systems, uh, water uh, uh, consuming systems uh, worldwide. And now uh, through iRISE, uh, the rice cultivation can become uh, much more water uh, efficient. You could work with half the water. Uh, so the drought uh, uh, risk would be lowered dramatically and uh, Basically, this system can save uh, around 20% uh, of the total world water consumption. And this is sounding crazy, but uh, have a look at Tafsif's presentation. And uh, he's still working with the Institute and um, so as a postdoc. And uh, so uh, this research is ongoing uh, now. Um, with such uh, systems, it's just uh, incredible that uh, well, we as a well small institute basically coming from the water profession uh, comes up with a solution that is sort of, uh, well, helping greatly to find a good future. Uh, Unfortunately, the driving force behind these things um, is not coming by itself because um, you, you won't easily earn money by uh, letting uh, family farmers know about this. So this requires committed people who develop a network 
And of course, we uh, are happy that the SRI community has well gladly taken this up. They were surprised and stunned and happy. And uh, so there is a big teaching network already. I hope this goes in there. But also we try to develop the systems further in Kashmir. And those of you who are interested to work with that, please join. Um, now uh, we come to an issue that is um, very interesting also for the future of agriculture. So during my break, um, with coffee, I had a snack, and that is a uh, tree crop uh, bread. So this is a uh, sweet chestnut and another tree crop. So there's uh, almonds on there and a shrub. So that would be uh, hazel and cacao, another tree. So tree crops are more common than we think, but uh, it could really replace a lot of the grain used worldwide. So if we grow sweet chestnut, we can have the same uh, yield of um, um, a staple food. And sweet chestnut uh, flour is great. It's a lot more healthy than uh, like wheat and other grains. And uh, it could uh, not only uh, replace monoculture, but it can also give place for a lot of insects, birds and bees. It makes wonderful honey also. So, so the, the, the flowering is great, looks really absolutely fantastic. Animals could graze in between the structures and, uh, of the sweet chestnut tree. We wouldn't monoculture. We would make it um, a, a mixed culture, of, of course. And I, I'm promoting this for agroforestry systems. And I'm building one of those also for the Institute as a research now on a plot of one hectare uh, in the region of Hamburg. And so we need more tree crops for uh, the um, uh, restoration of the soil, uh, the roots go deep and so on. And so there is the free book by uh, Russell Smith and a uh, free download for that one. And just look at that, copyright 1929. Uh, and uh, he saw all the problems with the land degradation at that time because uh, the US is horrible in this in large areas. Uh, so yeah, that's something to to look for. And uh, yeah, well, this is a picture from what there is. And walnut is also a good tree crop with omega-3 fatty acids that we have a complete lack of. And we have too much of the inflammatory omega-6. And that's part of the story why we have so widespread uh, illness, chronic illness, and so on uh, in the population. So it's about crazy food habits. Uh, acorns could even make um, also food if treated in the right way. Uh, Moringa could actually feed uh, probably half of the world easily on um, relatively small uh, plots of land uh, and fodder as well. And uh, anato could be another tree crop. And uh, we can bring these things together in different forms in the form of agroforestry. And we should include food production. And Professor Martin Wolf uh, from the UK, he is a pioneer in this field. He has recently died old age. His son is continuing and um, they have found a lot of well, ways of, of doing agroforestry with uh, grain fields, combining with grain fields and so on. Uh, there is also the organization of uh, Nature Fund um, in, in, uh, set up by Katja Wiese a great uh, activist. She's absolutely fantastic and, and great at fundraising. Uh, and they have helped so many uh, plantings of uh, agroforestry. So um, 
Ah, this slide is in the wrong place, uh, but um, the um, uh, nature fund projects include uh, Honduras reforestation with, with, within 18 months and becoming a very highly profitable uh, operation of cacao. Uh, well, cacao, it was just here on my snack. And uh, coffee, other plants intercropted, healthy and profitable. Another example of their work, Bolivia, 2,800 meters above sea level, uh, reforestation of a savanna area uh, within 10 years, 6% humus, absolutely amazing in such conditions, and back in agricultural operation. And thanks to Katya for her hard work, she's truly absolutely committed and uh, working day and night. And uh, there is uh, Patrick Worms, uh, who has a lot of good videos on um, agroforestry systems. So he's showing that the roots uh, can be going to different levels. And of course, the minerals are taken out here with the leaf. And then when the leaf is falling, this goes to the to the land in the uh, in the fall, and uh, this can bring the nutrients up there. There's one aspect of it. We did one system of combining agroforestry and uh, rainwater harvesting. So when you do these swales here, uh, you would plant trees along there, and that would be. Um, like the water would be remaining in the area, and so that's what we what we did there. And uh, um, all right, so um, there are hundreds of options in gardening as, as well, and I will go quickly through a few of them. So restoration um, in the large scale, there are great projects. Uh, you've seen maybe some of those. Uh, conversion uh, from barren land to uh, very more uh, rich uh, productive landscape, uh, reverse migration because uh, hardly any people can live in a barren land. And so people came back from the cities when they learned that their wells are filled up again and the land is productive. And uh, this was conversion over also around 10 years and uh, making the region productive. And uh, this is a project in China that was working based on family farms. And uh, this is very important. A lot of restoration reforestation projects is without the local people or even against local people. So there are projects where people are simply kicked out and this is something that is a violation of human rights in the name of green development or something. So we must take care that there is no uh, um, authoritarian structures building around pretending uh, to um, preserve nature. So nature can and shall uh, be together with people. There should be always some, some areas that keep untouched. Uh, but if we behave well as humans, we can um, make great systems. And these restored systems could have a lot of like family farms and be organized maybe in, by way of new town, what I said initially. Um, another great example is the La Ferme du Bec Elon in uh, Normandy uh, in, 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 in France. And uh, they have shown that you can restore uh, land that is not so productive anymore. And uh, they could show that you can have a, a income of like 40 to 50,000 euros on a thousand square meters of like uh, well-managed land in intercropping uh, with lots of compost, raising level of organics, good soil life, and um, that is, uh, well, it, it, it is, sounds incredible, but it's a lot of work at the same time. So um, these 40 to 50,000 euros are 
a good salary for a person or like two half jobs or three third uh, three three one third jobs for people who want to have the change between gardening and desk and so on um, yeah then um, I mentioned already the plant health pyramid so that should be applied first and foremost in all agricultural operation especially in gardening and that makes more and better food uh, Dan Kittrich has uh, shown the way forward. He's well ahead of most other people with so many aspects. And if you are having a keen interest in that, look at um, his, uh, he has a full weekend seminar online for free. And this is world class. So go for that. Look at that if you have the, the interest in that and spread the word. Once again, spread the word, please. Um, measuring success um, and um, Dan Kittredge also <clears throat> promotes strongly to measure uh, the, the, the bionutrient uh, density of uh, food because today we buy a carrot uh, for a price that is similar for all carrots. But imagine a carrot that has been grown on a, on a poor piece of land pushed by mineral fertilizers. Um, uh, well, it may look the same like one that has grown in a very rich organic soil with lots of soil life, with mycorrhizal fungi well supplied with all trace elements that would be very, very healthy. And um, that is uh, something uh, hard to prove and so uh, Dan has uh, developed a spectroscopy uh, for, <clears throat> for, for customers. So you can go to the store and check if this uh, carrot is, uh, is a very good one or a poor one. And uh, I would hope that the bad stuff is just uh, staying on the shelves and uh, people would be sort of forced to make real food. Uh, Charles Dowding, no dig, so recommended for specialists and this is recommended for those who want to go for uh, making this really uh, working out on an economic level. Uh, in my point of view, of view Jean-Martin Fortier is doing it too extremely, so they are very much looking into optimizing all the uh, economic cycles um, and but they have put a great example of how four people can live on um, 6,000 square meters of biointensive um, agriculture uh, um, gardening operation with lots of, of great products and they take six months of holiday every winter and um, one nice quote is from the book uh, we have that in the TU library in case you want to dig further and I strongly recommend this. Uh, one quote, uh, twittering of birds instead of motor noise. Uh, so that's what I really like very much. They use machinery about, but very little and of course we would make local companies that are producing electric uh, well, gardening equipment. Seeds are very, very important. Um, I think this link is not, not working anymore. Maybe somebody can look up a better link for uh, seeds policies, good seeds policies. Um, and uh, an interesting fact, inheriting knowledge about local seeds, plant varieties and nutritional healing properties can take one third of a lifetime for tribal people. Modern, igno modern, modern ignorance, ruthless business and the misuse of science and politics have brought us near a world monopoly of hybrid seeds that don't reproduce, that are often boring, monotonous, but long shelf life uh, varieties. And um, today they even mimic to make them taste not too bad because that's also a question of trace elements. 
and sometimes it's just the iron that is missing to make a tomato taste like a tomato even if it's a well bad chemical agrochemical um, cultivation uh, the intercropping <clears throat> there is also good agriculture going on in the eco village Les Schloss Tempelhof in the south of Germany and they do great work they also work with the techniques of uh, the market gardener Jean-Martin Fortier and others and uh, the work of uh, Stefan Hügel uh, is absolutely stunning so I mentioned his work on minerals by now and his system of um, well aquaculture uh, can really outcompete by far most other protein production uh, operations uh, worldwide and I'm not talking about the artificial stuff with like growing yeast and pretending that that is food uh, food production is much more than just producing biomass it is something where there is something growing in a natural ecosystem and developing things that um, well such artificial stuff can probably never never have uh, there is a lecture up in my channel and um, on on this system I gave the lecture because I didn't get one of Stefan at that time um, but he will also be in rural development next semester um, now some some um, final words about urbanization too much in many places and it can become dangerous cities can become traps easily and uh, that's something where uh, rural areas should be developed in a way that nature and humans cooperate produce a lot of food leave enough place for nature too and um, that's something what should be done um, the downside of over urbanization or urbanization in general is often a lack of care for soils slums desertification agrochemical soil poisoning and all and uh, the new town development that I'm promoting also videos up in my uh, channel or we have no we, we will have another lecture on in Nexus engineering on that specifically and that can make people productive and produce also for the city um, uh, context um, so farms small farms feed the world around 70 percent of all food today is produced by family farms and that's the actual world agricultural report and we should expand that by maybe new developments uh, eco villages uh, community projects uh, and so on and that's one of our fields of research so uh, cooperation by project work master thesis much appreciated just approach me also from outside if you're from other universities we are uh, more than willing to to help you do a project or a master thesis in this field external master thesis are um, appreciated so that could like also combine very well with the rotational grazing and so then we have also the agroforestry system with the trees tree crops um, in between aquaculture and uh, so on and make it a very pleasant environment while so many arable areas are like boring and not really fit for uh, a good life and uh, it's not about autarky I don't like that concept or um, well it's like living in the rural and producing for the cities as well producing great food on living soils all right so with this we come to the um, conclusions um, and that is uh, we are in systems thinking that's why this lecture is so long I want to present this all in a context so that you see all these interactions and we can solve the problems of the world but we can only solve them if we tackle them like in bundles or like make systems that solve many problems at the same time so 
the summary on regenerative agriculture, the end of humanity is likely uh, with if the world is run for profits at all costs. The understanding of soil vegetation systems is key to regenerative agriculture, to regenerating water resources, uh, food security, and it is the main way towards counteracting climate change as much as we as humans can do. The only limitation is that we may run too low in CO2 so that uh, this would be stopping growth and uh, make, putting a risk on the whole system. So, so building up soils is a long term. So that's something what is to, to be considered. There are many proven solutions in uh, large scale farming and hundreds of options uh, in small scale family farms. Yeah, a final word. We do have the knowledge, we do have the tools. We can convert barren land into thriving rural paradise. We can contribute to a good future for all. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. Uh, so I offer you these thoughts. Um, this is a type of systems thinking, thinking that is pretty unique. I have digging into these issues since at least 15 years intensively. I've worked in many parts of the world. I have had access to great people and learned from many, many people. And um, so I'm so grateful for all those pioneers. And I'm a pioneer myself in ecological sanitation. That is part of the story, of course. Um, and so I'm, I'm really appreciating the work of all the pioneers. And um, I hope you will be pioneering something in uh, what you really like to do. But before that, choose the pathway that you really love. Look what is really, really calling you and go for that. All right. And with that, I leave you with uh, some homework uh, in the next slide and also below uh, this video. Thanks very much for uh, well, coming that far and uh, learning all this stuff. So let's connect all the dots. Bye bye. Thank you.